And the, the hero for this project is the Namibian fog basking beetle, uh, which is just an absolutely fantastic creature. Sometimes I actually um, think I'm only a sort of part-time architect and the rest of the time I seem to be a sort of media promoter for this beetle. Uh, but it is pretty remarkable. This guy has evolved um, a way of harvesting its own fresh water in a desert location. And the way that it does this is that it has this matte black shell and it comes out of its hiding place at night and it's, it's able to radiate heat out to the night sky and become just slightly cooler than its surroundings. So when the moist breeze blows in off the sea, you get these droplets of water forming on the beetle's shell. And then just before the sun comes up, um, the beetle tips its shell up, the water runs down to its mouth, it has a good drink, and then goes off and hides for the rest of the day. Not a great quality of life, perhaps, but it is a clever trick. And um, that ingenuity, if you could call it that, goes even further, because you, you can probably just make out there are little bumps on the beetle's shell. And the tops of those bumps are hydrophilic, they're tracked water. And between the bumps is a waxy finish which repels water. And that means that as the water forms, it tends to stay in very tight droplets, spherical droplets, which means it's much more mobile than it would be if it was just a film of water. So even when there's only a small amount of moisture available in the air, the beetle is still able to harvest that really efficiently and conduct it down to its mouth. So it's a, an absolutely classic example of a, a, an amazing adaptation to a very resource-constrained environment. And in that sense, I think biomimicry has a, a huge amount to offer us for the kind of challenges that we're going to face this century. So there were a couple of other things that were in, in, in very much in our minds when we were thinking about this project. One was to uh, try and find solutions to global water shortages. And um, you know, water is really coming up the agenda in terms of um, its, its potential for causing conflicts uh, for, for, through resource shortages. And there are large parts of the developing world that are dependent on very unsustainable sources of water, groundwater that is being extracted at such a rate that it's starting to turn saline. And um, also peak oil, um, John talked quite a bit about peak oil, so I won't mention uh, that much. Only to say that in a way I find it quite amusing when, when people argue really vociferously about whether peak oil has already happened or whether it's in 10 years or 20 years. Because if you change the time axis, it does kind of end the argument. And what you're looking at there with that descent curve is, is either the most dramatic period of behavioral and technological change we've ever seen, or it's something a whole lot less pretty. Some people point to nuclear, but uranium has its own um, uh, peaking scenarios. And at the moment, we only get 3.5% of our um, net energy from nuclear. So if there was a big shift towards nuclear, then you're just likely to see those, those peaking scenarios coming much further forward. So I would argue that at, at best, nuclear is a short-term stopgap. And at worst, it's a dangerous distraction from what we really need to be doing. And what we really need to be doing is, is making that difficult shift from a carbon economy to a solar economy. And various people um, have been applying peak oil theories to other resources. And this is one that actually looks quite worrying because this suggests that phosphate production has, has already peaked. And phosphate is used to a, a massive extent in, in, in our industrialized agricultural systems. So if we start running out of phosphate, there's a very real chance that we'll start running out of food. So, the um, starting point in many ways for this project was, was a scheme called the, the Seawater Greenhouse. Um, and the Seawater Greenhouse was, was invented by this guy, Charlie Payton, who, who I'm working with. And it's a, a greenhouse for coastal arid regions. And um, it uses a process very similar to the, to the beetle. And in essence, what you have is uh, a wall of evaporators at the front. And you trickle seawater over those. So as the onshore breeze blows through that, it picks up a lot of moisture and is cooled in the process. So that means inside you have cool, humid air. So that's a much better growing environment for crops in arid regions. The roof has a double layer of polymer. Um, and the lower layer is opaque to infrared, which plants don't need, generally speaking. So that cuts out further heat. Um, and then there's also a, 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 an arrangement of black pipes in the roof that has seawater passing through them. And then that hot seawater from the roof goes through a second evaporator at the back so as the, as the air is passing through the greenhouse at that point, the temperature is raised and it can take on a lot more moisture. And then you have a series of um, vertical polythene tubes through which cooled seawater is passed. And that cooled seawater comes from the bottom of the front evaporator. So at that point, you've got hot, humid air 
meeting a, a large amount of, of cool surface, just like the beetle's shell. And what you get is a lot of distilled water condensing out and running down to the bottom where you can collect it. And the thing that was remarkable about this scheme was that it was actually producing more water than it needed for the plants inside to grow. And this first one built in Tenerife was nowhere near a town, so they weren't too sure what to do with this uh, surplus water, and they just started spreading it on the land around. And so the, the difference that that made from, from this picture taken after completion to two years later, it looked like that. So it's been like a, a green ink blot spreading out from the building, turning barren land back into biologically productive land. And in that sense, I think you could argue that it goes beyond sustainable de design to achieve restorative design. So that was one of the things that we were really keen to, to explore further. We wanted to scale this up and, and uh, maximize those benefits. Um, and and to, to apply various other biomimicry principles to the scheme. So we know from the three that have been built um, that they evaporate about 50 tons of seawater per hectare per day. So if you were to scale that up massively to, for example, something on this scale, this is um, 20,000 hectares of polytunnels um, and environmental disgrace, otherwise known as Almeria in southern Spain, a horrendously unsustainable form of agriculture, produces thousands of tons of plastic waste every year and is all based on groundwater, which is turning saline. So the Spanish government are building a whole string of uh, fossil fuel desalination plants around the coast. Uh, shame, because if that was uh, seawater greenhouses, that region would be a net producer of distilled water. But anyway, just take that figure of 20,000 hectares multiplied by 50 tons per hectare per day that would be evaporating about a million tons of seawater per day. So if we were to create a scheme of that sort of scale, then ideally we wouldn't want to have to pump that water because that would involve a lot of energy. So we've identified various places on, on, um, on land that are actually below sea level depressions. And there are quite a few of these around. Um, so if we could find some of these that allowed us to get a sea pipe to, to that location, then we could bring in unlimited quantities of seawater just under gravity. The other advantage of coming inland is that the air is much, much drier. On the coast, the relative humidity is about 70%. Inland, it's about 30%. And just that difference means that we could evaporate about three times as much fresh water. Sorry, evaporate about three times as much seawater and create that much more fresh water. Now, when we think about nature, we, we often think about it being all about competition. And, and that's certainly true up to a point. Um, and the, the German film director Werner Herzog says that uh, nature is just chaos and murder. Um, and I mean, he's partly right, but actually in mature ecosystems, you're just as likely to find really amazing examples of organisms that have hooked up to create symbiotic benefits. And so a fundamental principle of biomimicry is to try and find uh, or try and create examples of, of synergistic design, symbiotic relationships. So we looked around for other types of technology that could be symbiotic with the uh, seawater greenhouse.